Amen. Till my 
Good morning, GCF Northeast. Come and pray with me today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you. Praise you in your sanctuary. We praise you in your mighty heavens. Father, you are the one who is in control of all things, who made all things. Nothing that happens in our world that you do not allow. There's nothing that takes place that is a surprise to you. Even this pandemic, you're not surprised. We praise you for your faithfulness. And we praise you for your great power and love. Father, we thank you for your promise in 1 John 1.19 that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive them. Purify us from all our righteousness. So we humbly come to you as we confess and ask that you forgive us our sins. We are sinners and so unworthy of you. Cleanse us, O Lord. May we be aware of your grace and mercy. Clothe us with your righteousness. Lord, we need you in our lives. We struggle. We worry. We get weary. But yet, you are always there. You never leave us. We thank you for your wonderful assurance that we have a living hope. And because we have, we can endure anything in this life we throw and we can faithfully obey you no matter what. Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives, for your goodness and blessings that you shower us. We thank you for the provisions that we need to be able to sustain ourselves, our families during these difficult times. We adore you and our heart overflows with gratitude for all these overflowing blessings. Father, it is said in your word that the kingdom is yours and you rule over the nation. So we come to you acknowledging your sovereignty and authority over all the nations, 
our country with all this conflict and tension worries and uncertainty especially this new lockdown that we have uh, this pandemic has brought upon us Lord uh, we just we just lift them up to you let us be reminded that one day God will finally judge the whole earth for rejecting your son Jesus Christ and this is just a foretaste of what it is to come let us respond in repentance and acceptance of the gospel we pray for our nation and leaders give them wisdom that they may be able to do things beyond their understanding let there be calmness in this nation allow the hearts of your people to overflow with love for one another Lord we ask for wisdom for our national leaders to lead this to lead this country all right bless and protect your health workers not just the frontliners but also the ones who man the drug stores the bank the groceries those people who keep the areas clean PUVs be with them as they are the ones who are most exposed protect them watch over them father there's there's so many things besetting this country but because you are seated on your throne we are confident that as we bring these concerns to you you are the ones to answer these prayers but we pray for our church we entrust to you all these things knowing that you would be with us in this journey and your presence is greater than anything your people will face give us comfort and peace guide us forward into your love may your purposes for allowing this difficult times and permitting this uh, pandemic to hit us be fulfilled may christians be inspired to share the gospel may those who do not know jesus christ finally come to faith in him as they are aware of mortality and how life can be so brief in this moment of silence would you receive this humble prayer of thanks to praise you to remember your faithfulness in our lives your grace and your mercy to remember your forgiveness so that we may be able to fully praise you today lord finally we pray for our pastor as he preaches we thank you for using him mightily for the study of your word. We pray for insight and understanding, Lord, as we listen to them. Open the eyes of our hearts. Make them tender. Lord, thank you for this time that we could pray together as a church virtually. All these things we ask and pray in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to GCF Northeast online service. And thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Important announcements due to the rising cases of COVID, especially in Quezon City, the council has unanimously agreed that we are going to postpone indefinitely our supposedly first on-site or first in-person worship service. Please pray that uh, uh, the election also, for the election of our deacons and deaconesses, uh, hopefully by Wednesday, uh, we'll be able to post it in our page, the nominees and the list of candidates for deacons and deaconesses. And third, we urge you to join the women's uh, seminar uh, on this coming uh, Sunday. And there will be three groups, uh, one for the beginners, navigation of the Bible, to be led by Dr. Raquel Mendoza. And then, uh, why study the Bible book by book? And that will be, uh, I will facilitate on that. And then, um, uh, hermeneutics, you know, introduction to uh, hermeneutics by uh, Pastor Nikki Hoya. I hope and pray that you can join us. We continue with our study on the, chap on, on the uh, Gospel of John. And we're in John chapter 8. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this earth would be a cold, dark, and a lifeless planet if there were no sun in the sky 
to give light and warmth. The sun, as we have been taught in science, is at the center of the solar system. And some scientists call it the light, small letter L, of the world. The uh, such, such a figures, brothers and sisters in Christ, reveal the sun's greatness. For example, the distance between the moon and between the earth and the sun is 93 million miles. If a baby would start flying to the sun at birth at a speed of 250 kilometers per hour, he would be nearly 71 years old upon arrival. But the sun, in spite of its greatness, is not known as the light, capital L, of the world. The light of the world is the eternal Son of God, sent from heaven to earth by the Father. The light of the world is Jesus Christ. Jesus declared himself as the light of the world. He is the one who created the Son, who existed with the Father in creation. He is the one who declared, I am the light of the world. Though it is beyond our grasp. And uh, let us uh, reach out by faith and try to understand what it meant when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And let us ask ourselves, has the eternal Son of God, the light of the world, had a great impact or influence in our lives, just like the sun that shines on the earth. Our passage this morning is found in John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20. John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20, and reading from the NASB. Please read with me. Verse 12, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world, the one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I am testifying about myself, my testimony is true, because I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Verse 15, you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two people is true. I am he who testifies about myself and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Verse 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple area. And no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. This is God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we thank you for your word. And now we pray that by your Spirit, you would indeed bless it to us as we examine it together. For Jesus' sake, amen and amen. John, the Apostle John, all throughout chapter 7, has been showing us that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Feast of the Booths. In the middle of the feast that celebrated God's dwelling with his people in the wilderness, Jesus came and tabernacled with them. And in our time, it is the Holy Spirit that comes and dwells in us. And in the middle of the feast that celebrated God's provision, Jesus Christ invited those who are thirsty to come and drink. And out of the heart of those who believe in him, will flow rivers of living water because the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in them. And so now we know with confidence, brothers and sisters in Christ, that the Lord will never leave us nor abandon us because He dwells among His people. And this message has stirred up the crowd. Well, I believe that there were a certain few 
who believed and committed their lives to Him. But there were so many who believed, but they did not commit their lives to, the, to Jesus as their Lord. And there were so many also who rejected Him. And in the midst of this chaos, Jesus is about to proclaim that He is the light of the world. Now, during this feast, another important fact, uh, the court of women had been lit up by four great or big lampstands called menorahs, which were part of the festival ceremonies. These lamps were part of the commemoration of God's guiding the people in the wilderness by a pillar of cloud and fire. Numbers 13, 21 reads, And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of fire not only led them, but also served as protection. Brothers and sisters in Christ, before the, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, this pillar of cloud and fire stood between them and the Egyptian army. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 to 20, Then the angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Therefore, the one did not approach the other all night. We also see in our passage today that this all happened in the treasury. Verse 20, the first half, it says, These words he spoke in the treasury, and the treasury was in the court of women. So while uh, the menorahs, were lit in the treasury, and while the people celebrated the uh, dwelling of God and the leading of God uh, uh, to his people in the wilderness, Jesus proclaimed that he is the light of the world. Verse 12 again, it says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. The people would have immediately thought of this, of the exodus and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And they would have immediately understood that this statement was related to the display of God's presence among his people. Hebrew prophecy spoke of the Messiah in, a com in, in terms of a coming light in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he will make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And this prophecy, according to Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, it says, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death upon them. A light dawned. In addition, light is used, an anal as, is used as an analogy to describe God and what He extends from Him to us. For example, in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? In Psalm 36, verse 9, For the fountain of life is with you in your light. We see light. And in Psalm 89, verse 15, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. Lord, they walk in the light of your face. So those present, when Jesus proclaimed, 
I am the light of the world. They understood what he said, that he was making a proclamation concerning himself, that he was the promised Messiah, and he was the fulfillment of the prophecies in Isaiah and other Old Testament scriptures, and in uh, keeping with the many statements in the book of Psalms about God, the Lord, the creator, the sustainer of all things. The one true God, the one who led Israel through the wilderness. And now, Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. He is not claiming a light among other many lights. He is the light. And with these menorahs, this lar large lamp stand surrounding them, everyone knew exactly what he meant when he said, I am. I am the light of the world. Israel would have been hopelessly and helplessly lost in the wilderness without God going before them. Likewise, mankind is lost in the dark, in the darkness when without Jesus Christ. May I repeat that? Israel would be helplessly and hopelessly lost in the wilderness without God before them. And likewise, mankind is lost in the darkness without Jesus Christ. Satan has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whose case the God, small letter G, of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You see, they cannot perceive the truth. They will never understand the truth. They just stumble over their sin and cannot find the path of righteousness. They need the light to show them the way. They need the Savior, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Now, I would like you to think about this. What is the purpose of the pillar of cloud and fire? In Exodus, is it there for decoration? Is it there to be marveled over? No, yung mga tao, oh, tignan nyo, poste ng apoy, poste ng gulap. Ang ganda, picture tayo doon. It led them, it guided them. It was meant to be followed. It would be silly for the people of Israel to look at the pillar of cloud and fire, and then sit idle in the dark. They won't move. They will just stare at the pillar of cloud and fire and enjoy the scenery. No, it was meant to be followed. Likewise, if the pillar of fire was meant to be followed, so is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again in verse 12, I am the light of the world, the one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. What a wonderful invitation. Belief in Christ is not merely intellect. It is a lifestyle. It is an active following after the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we see in Israel's example, it is not easy to follow the light of the world. The Lord led them through the wilderness for 40 years, 40 long years, and many of them never even made it to the promised land. And so following Jesus does not guarantee prosperity. Your life here on earth may be terrible. It is plagued with famine, with disease, with crisis, with pandemic, with trials. With death, you, can, you, you, you cannot get what you long for here on earth. But you know what? In Christ, we have eternal hope that can never perish. The trials of this life, brothers and sisters in Christ, cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So while we walk in the wilderness of life, we have Jesus Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, 
but will have the light of life in the midst of trials, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the light of life. We have Jesus. That's all that we need. Now, perhaps you're ask, you want to ask, how do I actually follow Jesus and begin to walk in the light? First, we have to get into God's Word regularly. We have to read and study the Word of God. And as we do that, let us ask Him to reveal Himself more to us, that He will speak to us re relationally and intimately. And as we pray that He reveals more of Himself to us, we know that. You know? It, it says that if we keep His commandments, He will reveal Himself more to us. And therefore, we are to choose to actually do what the Word says. As we discover what His light says about our job, about our relationships, about our priorities, our family life, about enduring trials, about all these things, then we are to follow what He says. And lastly, we have to live our life the way Jesus lived. How did He do that? Total dependence on the Father. He always obeyed the Father. And that's what we have to strive to do. And therefore, to follow Jesus means to make Jesus the boss, the Lord of our lives. Now, following Jesus is the condition of two promises in verse 12. The first promise is that you'll never walk in darkness. The second one is that you will reflect the light of life. And so, his followers will never walk in darkness, which is re a reference to the assurance of salvation we enjoy. Jesus illuminates the darkness. What is darkness? Simply put, brethren, it is the absence of light. Have you been into a room that is so dark? Will it, good, will it do a good? I'm sorry, will it do you any good to just stand there and then shout at the darkness or curse the darkness? No, you have to turn on the light. And darkness flees. I remember uh, Ineng and I joined the underground uh, river tour in Palawan. And when we were in the middle of the, the, the river, the, the boatman or the guide just turned off the searchlight. It was pitch dark. Ineng was beside me wearing an orange vest, but I could not see her. In fact, I nearly panicked and I told the boatman, please turn on the light. Baka meron dito mabangga tayo ng ibang mga bangka. Or perhaps, baka meron mga buaya dito. Pero wala naman po. Okay? But, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, biblically speaking, darkness is a symbol of life without God, who is the light. And so to live without the knowledge of God and His Word, is to walk in darkness. It is a spiritual darkness. Whoever doesn't follow Jesus will remain in the darkness, will remain lifeless. Therefore, we are commanded to follow the light of the world. And true followers of Jesus will never follow the ways of sin. They will never, they will never live in a state of continually sinning. 1 John chapter uh, uh, 5, where it says, sorry, where is it? First chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Therefore, what we are to do, we are to repent of our sins so that we'll stay close to the light of the world. Now, the second promise is that we will reflect 
the light of life just as Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, came as the light of the world. He commands us to be lights too. Just as the moon that doesn't have its own light, reflecting the light of the sun, we as believers should reflect the light of the Son of God. Now, the light is evident to others by the good deeds that we do by faith as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, the second point we see in verses 13 to 20, and we'll see the Jews' response. Now, in verse 13, there were some Pharisees who were there in the crowd. They understood what Jesus said when he said, I am the light of the world. And they could never let this uh, go undisputed. Here it says, So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. The Pharisees seem to be saying, No, you are making these incredible claims, but you are only, they are all come from your mouth. How can we believe you? You alone are the one claiming this. How can we believe that you are not a madman, that you are not a lunatic? You don't have witnesses to back up your claims. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you see, a witness is very essential to or in establishing a, a claim to be factual. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, it reads, On the testimony of two witnesses, or three witnesses, the condemned shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, a single witness shall not rise up against a person regarding any wrongdoing or any sin that he commits on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. We see in those verses that we just read the importance of having two or three witnesses in order to uh, establish, in order to, uh, for a charge against someone to be established as true. Someone cannot be pr uh, prosecuted uh, on the basis of a single witness. During their time, my word against your word won't cut it. So the, 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 the Pharisees are dismissing the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ because he does not have witnesses. He doesn't have these witnesses to back up his claims, to confirm his claims. Uh, is that true? Is the Lord Jesus Christ the only one proclaiming these truths? No, remember, John the Baptist bears witness to Jesus Christ. Jesus' works bear witness about himself. And then in chapter 5, the scriptures bear witness about Jesus Christ. And the Father bears witness about him. Yes, Jesus is bearing witness about himself, but he is not the only one claiming these truths. And you see, these religious leaders, they are only concerned in silencing Jesus. And what did they do? They just put their hands over their ears and they shut down their eyes, shut their eyes to the witnesses that have validated the words of Jesus. And in verses 15 to 16, you judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone, the Lord said. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Now, when Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh, it means when you judge, you judge with a limited, incomplete and flawed understanding of things. And therefore, your judgments are at best flawed. This was particularly true of the Pharisees, but it is true of all of us in one degree or another. But I'm sure you've experienced this, haven't you? 
You know what it is like to make a decision about something where your understanding of things is limited and flawed and incomplete. And it is very frustrating. Oh, sometimes I wish I were omniscient. But I am glad I am not because I doubt if I could stand there. But what I'm saying here is we have all experienced the frustration of having to make judgments concerning something where we lack the ability to see all the facts clearly. And so because we are not all knowing, we are always dependent on witnesses on the testimony of others. <coughs> and in verses 15, 16, Jesus contrasts himself with them as being opposites. They are judgmental and uh, with the wrong basis of, uh, for their judgments. They judge by how they perceive things, but they do not investigate the reality as I've already pointed out, they've already dismissed Jesus as the Messiah. Why? Because he appeared to be, he looked like a Galilean. He grew up in Nazareth. Perhaps he had Galilean friends. Perhaps he had Galilean accent. And so they said he is not a Judean. But if they would have just investigated more, they would have known that he was born in Bethlehem in Judea just as the prophecy had said. In verse 17, it says, even in your law, it has been written, Jesus says, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two people is true. It is almost as if Jesus is saying, okay, you need two witnesses, here you go. Jesus says, you know, I bear witness about myself and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. The Father who sent the Son now bears witness to the Son. And you see the perfect harmony between Jesus and the Father. And what was the response of the religious leaders? Ito parang ganito lang po, itas mo ang kilay ko. At para sila mga nakangiting aso, when they ask, where is your Father? They completely rejected what Jesus had said. What Jesus had claimed. They were hardening their hearts. Their hearts were hardened. And that is a very dangerous response to the truth because God might, try, might uh, harden your heart just like what he did to Pharaoh. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this man were already blind to what Jesus was claiming. And so Jesus answered them, in a rebuke, he rebuked them in the second half of verse 19. You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. The reason that they rejected Jesus and also that they would not recognize the claims of Jesus as truthful because they rejected the father. They are unable to recognize Jesus as the light of the world because they don't know the Father. You see the irony of this? They are celebrating the faithfulness of God, a God whom they don't know. What a tragedy. They were not interested in knowing Him. They were not interested in obeying Him. The religious system that they created by perverting the Mosaic law, was all about earning their way to heaven according to their own self-righteous system. And there are so many people today who are in the same way. They have uh, replaced the laws of God with their own rules and regulations and uh, where they prided themselves as being close to God because they kept and observed the laws of God. But the truth is, they were very far from God. And this tells us that you may know the Bible and not know God at all. And so, in verse 20, despite the stern rebuke, it reads, These words he spoke in the treasury 
as he taught in the temple area, and no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. In response to Jesus' rebuke, no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the third time since the start of John chapter 7 in their, uh, their attempt to arrest Jesus fell short. And you know what it tells us? No persecution falls outside the sovereign hand of God. Jesus will be arrested when it is time for him to be arrested. And so, what do we get out of these verses? Brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, you've heard Jesus' proclamation. I am the light of the world. And which is true of you? Have you received that message? Or have you rejected it? Allow me to share the gospel truth again to you. We are all alienated from God by our sin. And that we are bound to suffer eternally in hell. Unless we get right with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. For who he is, the incarnate God. The eternal Son of God sent from heaven to earth by the Father. And for what he did, for living to merit us righteousness and dying on the cross to pay the debt for our sin and physically rising from the dead to secure our eternal salvation, to secure the salvation of those who will believe in him. That's the gospel. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? And what can the gospel do? My friends, even though you've been stuck with a rotten personality for decades, Jesus can take off the clothes of your old life and replace or exchange them with new ones. And you will be more beautiful than you've ever been before. You will be given a new nature. That's the power of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel can do. He takes the rugs of our old selves and replaces them with something brand new. That, to me, is the heart of what biblical optimism is all about. Through Jesus Christ, real change is possible. Through Jesus Christ, habits of decades can be radically changed. Through Jesus Christ, destructive patterns of behavior can be changed and we can be truly transformed. Through Jesus Christ, even though we walk in today with an old life, we can walk out with a new one. That is the promise of the gospel. That's why I am excited about my future. That's why you should be excited about your future. Because change is real. Real change is possible. You don't have to stay the way you are. And second, <laughs> second application, <coughs> Jesus Christ, the light of the world, told us to love our enemies and to forgive those who have spitefully used us. Yet many, maybe most of us, prefer the darkness of choosing not to forgive or not to extend grace. The, dark, the darkness of earlier struggles can hold a person or even paralyze any advance, advancement. And Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, wants us to flee the darkness that has shackled us. He wants us to free, uh, he wants to free us from the pain of failed relationships that can hinder our testimony, our witness, that can stunt our spiritual growth. Have you ever thought or said, Pastor, you just don't understand how hurt I was. You just don't know what he did to me. I could never forgive that person. As long as a person nurses the pain, relieves the struggles, and talks about the loss, 
brothers and sisters in Christ. He keeps the conflict alive and allows what occurred in the past, what happened to continue to affect him negatively. You see, some people have become so captive to what has happened to them. They keep on thinking and rethinking and rethinking of things that cannot be outdone. Siya na lamang lagi nasa isip po yung taong nakasakit sa'yo. Kaya hindi mo pa siya mapatawad. Lagi mo nalang iniisip. Andun yung galit mo. Hindi mo alam na apektuhan na yung physical, emotional, even your spiritual health. Brothers and sisters in Christ, until we forgive a person, that person will continue to have power over us. Of all people, Jesus Christ knew about the power of forgiveness. While hanging on the cross, he said of those who crucified him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if the purpose of light is to eliminate darkness and illuminate what is hidden, what do you think will happen if you ask Jesus, the light of the world, to forgive you of your sins? You know, your slates get wiped clean and you will be given a brand new life. And when you forgive others, brothers and sisters in Christ, the light overcomes the darkness of pain, of sorrow and hurt. The light allows the freshness of your relationship with Jesus to flourish. But when someone withholds grace to a person who has done something bad to him, he refuses to go through that door of light. And he remains in the darkness of pain and hurt and sorrow. Yes, as Christians, of course, we cannot ask others. We cannot ask them to beg grace from us because that alone defies the definition of grace, which is unmerited favor. Grace is mercy granted when it is not deserved. And so let us not hold grudges, for that is darkness, but let us try to forgive. And when we do, we walk through that door of light. Well, there are also many other examples of darkness that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to leave behind. Worst of all darkness is the darkness when people say there is no God. Choosing to remain in darkness continues to trend upwards in our culture. And as Christians, this should be alarming on two fronts. First, we should be concerned that there are so many young people now who don't see any reason to believe that there is a God. And so they miss out God's grace and peace and mercy. Why? Because they have chosen darkness rather than light. But secondly, the rising number of people who don't see any reason to believe in God, the rising number of people who don't believe in God is really an indictment upon us, Christians, the church, because we have not acted as light by reflecting the light of the Son of God. You see, if Christians just lived and followed Christ more closely, then people who don't believe in God people who don't see any reason to believe in God will see more examples of light rather than darkness moving through or rather than shadows moving through the darkness. May I repeat that? If Christians live and follow Jesus more closely, then the people who don't see any reason to believe in God, who don't believe in God, 
who don't have a personal relationship with God will see more examples of light rather than shadows moving through the darkness. You see, Jesus' greatest judgment was not for the sinners of his day, but it was reserved for the religious leaders whose actions don't match their speech. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is truly the light of the world. There is ample evidence that his claims, that his witness is true. And therefore, it means we should follow the light of the world. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would take these words and make them a balm to those who are hurting and use them to bring healing and change. Father, in and of ourselves, we hide from your light and we love darkness. But the darkness is not dark to you. And so shine your light into this room, into our hearts by your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now to him who is able to do far more beyond all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen and amen.